أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم وهو أرحم الراحمين اذهبوا بقميصي هذا فألقوه على وجه أبي يأتي بصيرا وأتوني بأهلكم أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد once again everybody assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh i am really happy that i have the opportunity and the honor of sharing this remarkable surah and the more i study it the more the further we get along the more intimidated i get about the ocean of knowledge that's in it and how many things that i'm able to find or i'm able to you know discover with the help of colleagues and friends and how many more droplets of ocean we're missing out. And I pray that we're able to do some justice to this profound, really, ocean of knowledge, endless ocean of knowledge and wisdom that Allah has given us. Um, we are now arguably in the most beautiful part of the surah. This is the portion of the surah that's all about redemption, all about moving forward, all about resolving all of the tensions that have been built for so much of the real estate of this surah. And so we're going to continue the conversation, the monologue that Yusuf salam had with his brothers. So he started off what I talked about to you last time in ayahs number uh, 91 and 92. La alaykum There's no shaming, guilting, bringing up the past, you know, re uh, unearthing the ugliness of what transpired. That's not going to happen today against you. May Allah forgive you or Allah, Allah will forgive you. He is the most loving and caring of all those that can show love and care. I analyzed whatever I could of that ayah with you last time. But Yusuf Ali is not done talking. So he's going to say something else. And it's going to be pretty unusual and very beautiful. Um, he says to them, hadha. So let's start with a shallow translation. Uh, take this shirt of mine. So go with this, or literally go with this shirt of mine. فَأَلْقُوهُ عَلَى وَجْهِ أَبِي Then cast it on my father's face. So take this shirt of mine. Then cast it on my father's face. Yati basira, he will come with full sight. It, it, it means two things. Yati basira could be translated in two ways. It could mean he'll come with vision, meaning he'll come to Egypt. By the time he comes to me, he'll have his vision restored. It can also mean he will become someone who can see again. He will transform back to someone who can see. So two implications. Wa tuni bi ahlikum ajma'in and bring me your families, all of them. Meaning, bring me every member of your family, your wives, your children, everybody. I want to see everybody, right? So that's this ayah. Um, it packs quite a punch, this ayah. There's a lot going on here. And the first thing that I'm going to talk about is maybe not directly so much this ayah. It's related to this ayah, but it's about the larger theme of the surah itself. By the way, Seiko, if you need to get out, you can get out this way and that's you don't feel stuck, okay? You're good, okay. Is sound okay? Everybody's okay with sound? If you click on the top right on comments, you'll see. That's a part of the interruption, but um, anyway. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is there's a lot of curiosity about the the, the one of the running themes in the surah, which is the shirt. Uh, it's occurred in three contexts. The first time the brothers, you know, took Yusuf alayhi salam to a well, took his shirt from him, put blood on it, and presented it to their father with the story that a wolf ate him. Right. So the false shirt. The bloodied shirt was the first time we saw or heard about a shirt in this uh, in this story. The second time is when Yusuf alayhi salam was being pursued by a psychotic minister's wife who just wanted him at all costs and was willing to rip his shirt from behind in pursuit of him as he was running for the door. And then that shirt and the fact that it was ripped from behind was used to substantiate the evidence that Yusuf alayhi salam in fact was the one running away. She was the one chasing. She's the one that's guilty. And it was the shirt was used to prove his innocence. But regardless that his innocence was proven immediately, he ended up in jail anyway. And nobody said a word about it. Nobody had a problem with it. It was a politically wise decision. They they thought, you know, uh, after min baadi mara awl ayat an yasjunu hatta hain that they after they saw all the signs, this may be politically inconvenient for us to keep him roaming around for free. It'll turn into a bigger scandal because all of these women were involved in it now. So maybe it's better that he kept be kept detained for some time. And that some time became several years. The third time we're seeing this shirt is this ayah. Take this shirt of mine, then, then cast it on your my father's face. He'll come back to vision 
or to some being someone who can see and bring your families all of them. So there are three shirts. And the question rose, well, you know, what are the, what's the significance of the shirt in this in this story? Why is the shirt being brought up? There must be some wisdom behind this recurring theme or this recurring reference to a shirt. It could have been anything else, but it keeps coming back to be a shirt. Um, so there are, you know, different kinds of observations in our literature and tafsir, different reflections, contemplations on this. There are no hard and fast rules or answers to this. Um, it's not like there's a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu telling us what the significance of the shirt is. This is an exercise in contemplating and reflecting on the Quran. And so I'm really grateful that one of the one of the aspects of my study of the Quran is that I get to take advantage of a Quran study group. So myself, Sheikh Suhaib, and a few other brilliant young uh, scholars are part of this small WhatsApp group where we, where when I'm preparing for a lecture, and I think there's a there's room for everybody to collaboratively discuss and share ideas and reflections. I post you know things, and they post their research papers and other interesting uh, pieces on there. It's a very exclusive private cult, no group uh, that I'm a part of. But today, I you know I wanted to post that. You know, what do you guys think about this shirt? Here are my thoughts about it, and I want you guys to you know chime in. And some really beautiful contemplations came out of that. And I want to take advantage of you know what was shared, some of the things that I shared, and some of the things that you know some of my friends and colleagues shared, because I thought they were very beautiful. And so this is basically a summary of the discussion we had in our group about the shirt and what it's doing in the story of Yusuf Ali And I'll start with my own comments as I wrote them um, and, and summarize those to you. Uh, but in order to make sense of this, let us let me recap real quick so you guys can keep up with what I'm saying, okay? So the shirt has come up how many times? Three times, yeah? The first time, the shirt with blood on it. The second time, the shirt that got ripped by the, la the lady. The third time, take the shirt of mine, give it back to dad, his vision will come back. So the first shirt with the blood on it, we'll call it one. The second shirt that was ripped, we'll call it two. And the third shirt, we'll call it three, right? So that's just to keep, so instead of me saying the shirt with the blood, the shirt that got ripped, it's, a, it's too wordy. So one, two, and three. Those are the three shirts we're talking about. So as I make reference to these numbers, that's what I'm referring to, okay? So... One was brought to father with a malicious lie against Yusuf. And look at the poetic justice that now they have, the same people who brought shirt number one to dad to convince him of a lie, now have to bring him shirt number three and embarrassingly tell him the truth. The same lie that they, they created with one shirt has to be undone with the other shirt, right? So it's you know, the, the the crime was created by that shirt and now the resolution of it is coming with a shirt. It's also interesting that Yusuf Alayhi of all things he could have given to them, because, you know, apparently he has cups to spare. So he gave a cup to Benjamin too, right? There's money to spare. There's other things you can give, a letter, any memento. But he decided of all things to give a shirt to them. And there are different aspects to that as we'll see. But one of those aspects is, you guys like taking shirts from me, huh? You know what? I'll just give you one. And you what? What you did with that shirt? You 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 give it to dad to prove to him that I'm dead. Well, now you're gonna give him a different shirt. How about you make up for that one shirt you took, and now you do you make things right. So it's kind of this poetic justice taking place, and one shirt being taken to dad in the beginning, and a very different shirt being taken back in the end. The shirt of the shirt of falsehood in the beginning, and the shirt of truth at the end, isn't it? Right. So that's one. Um, one was forcefully taken, and while the other, shirt number one was forcefully taken, obviously Yusuf Alayhisam didn't take a shirt off for, for them to take, and they were in a position of power and authority. And in, in number three, the shirt is being given to them with authority, go take this. So who's got the authority now? And they were taking it, but now it's being given to them, and they're being commanded to take it back to the father. Um, one presents, you know, this is about you know, um, a problem and a resolution. So one, the shirt number one presented a false case and it remained unresolved, an unresolved mystery for several years, right? So one presented a, a false case and the lie remained unsolved for several years. And three represents the truth and resolves the case, right? That's, we've said that so far. So that's one in three, but what about two in the middle? Two could have been used as evidence against Yusuf. And immediately, so the false case could have been made, and immediately the case was solved also. So what you see now is, in one case, shirts are being used, or a shirt is being used, 
to create a lie that can last a long time before a resolution is reached. And in the other case, the same thing that could have been used as a lie against Yusuf Alaihissalam, the same thing was used as evidence for Yusuf Alaihissalam, and that too immediately. What we might learn from that is that sometimes we face problems in this life and Allah in His wisdom has it that the resolution for that problem could take many years. And we may not never we, know, we may not see the solution to that problem for a very long time. And there are other times that Allah decides that you can see the solution to that problem immediately. And you know what? Sometimes even getting the immediate solution to a problem doesn't make things better. You think, I just want this resolved. I want my innocence proven. Yusuf had his innocence proven. Did that help? No. In fact, the fact that he got his innocence proven made her angry and made things exponentially worse for him, actually. And the time it took to resolve what was very painful for Yusuf Alayhisalam and extremely painful for his father. And all of these trials that he went through at the end of the day had wisdom and good come of it that couldn't have come otherwise. Right? So sometimes, you know, like Allah says, Kalla bal al -ajila. Like you people love to rush. You want to get re things resolved quickly. Allah decides which problems will be resolved quickly, which problems will be resolved over time. And sometimes things that come quickly aren't the best, even though we think they are. And sometimes that th things that take their time and they cause pain are the best, even though we think they're not, right? So that's yet another reflection on the shirt and the time associated with them. D is also a little bit tricky because, um, you know, so I've got A, B, C, and D so far. Um, an intimately personal artifact can be used to substantiate a lie if one isn't careful to examine the evidence. Here's the thing. We are used to now in modern culture, especially in social media culture, we're used to sound bites. They found evidence. This person did X, Y, Z. How do we know? Well, his shirt was there. Or they left behind some, they found drops of blood, or they found their DNA, or they found whatever, they found a hair, right? They, they'll take a strand of evidence and say, since we found this evidence, it's clear this is the person who did X, Y, Z, right? Now, the thing is, Let's take about, talk about the shirt that got ripped for a moment. If the headlines were, Yusuf tried to take advantage of the woman of the house, and it was proven because they, they, his shirt was ripped. When they came out, his shirt was ripped. And they conveniently skip a little bit of the detail. His shirt was ripped from where? Behind. Like you just skip that a little bit and say his shirt was ripped. And the news spreads like wildfire that this man, she was trying to save herself and she ripped his clothes and... The, you know, because once you say a shirt was ripped on the headline, the rest will be filled in by people's creativity, isn't it? And people will say, obviously, this was a crime. They found a shirt. His shirt was ripped. And they'll be so convinced that they have the absolute truth on their side because the evidence being presented is something intimately close to the person being talked about. Just because the evidence comes from something close, like a shirt, nothing's closer to my body than my shirt. Or the evidence come from, comes from someone close to you. That doesn't make the evidence foolproof. That doesn't mean you have to reserve judgment until you actually analyze. We are too quick to pass judgment on things that we now get in sound bites. You just get a headline and you already know this person did it. You know, they found this, they found that. They found skid marks of the car. They found tire tracks. They found a shoe print. They found this, you know, and immediately it's done. Or if it's not physical evidence that is of intimate nature, close nature, then it's a person. His best friend said da da, da 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 His own wife said this, this, this. His son said this, this, this. His brother said this, this, this. Her uncle said this, this, this. They would know, right? They're lying too. So when someone's close to you, all of a sudden, that's automatically what? It's it's credibility. Well, his brothers called him a, a thief, didn't they? So just because someone's close to you and they're speaking, everybody else will say, well, his own family said that, you know, X, Y, Z. That doesn't make it true, does it? And family can present... Some, if, you, if you take the story, even though I'm digressing from the shirt for a moment, if you take the story of... You know, the, the, the narration that Yusuf salam had stolen the idol from his grandfather, his maternal grandfather, so he wouldn't do shirk. When they retell the story and call him a thief, are they going to give that context or no? Mufassirun will give that context and say he actually did something good. He was trying to prevent, he was doing something similar to his grandfather, Ibrahim salam, Great grandfather, isn't it? 
because he broke the idols. Now he's taking the idol. He's like he's following in his dad's footsteps. It's something commendable. But if you skip out some details and you just use the first part of the sentence, he stole. And even if that's true, what does that make him look like? You understand? So partial evidence or looking at evidence without thoroughly analyzing the entire context is a remarkably dangerous thing to do. And that would have happened even in the case of the rib shirt. What did the father do? The father looked at the shirt with blood, analyzed it and said, no, this is Allah al-musta'an ala matalhu. He saw through it. He saw through it. He carefully analyzed the evidence and how is it even, there's no evidence that the shirt was ripped the, the, the first time. They, said put, they, they didn't tear it and put blood on it. They just put blood on it. Right? That's one way of looking at it. I'm like, how did the wolf get all this blood on it and the shirt's not even ripped? Or the tears don't look like the tears made by an animal. You know, they're really neat tears. <laughs> how did you do, how did an animal do this? How come the tears are over here, but the blood drops are over there? Like you could just analyze it a little carefully, right? And you start poking holes in a theory. So the whole innocent until proven guilty is now out of the window because, you know, thrown out the window because innocent so long as we find any shred of evidence and the rest is unnecessary. Now, uh, my, my wife Valerie, who's sitting here, had some thoughts about the same thing, the shirt. So I decided to incorporate that because I, I appreciated the, uh, the insight. So we're talking about one, two, and three, right? One was an act of humiliating and abandoning a child. So taking a child's clothes and then abandoning them in a well, humiliating, insulting him and abandoning him in a well. That was one. Two, the shirt number two, was an act of humiliating a, a man by the woman, right? She's trying to humiliate him by treating him like an object that she can just, you know, make use of and, and cast away and slander if she feels like, because what does his life matter? What does his dignity matter? So it's an, the, the second shirt is also associated with humiliating, and it also is associated with abandonment. Why, why abandonment? Because the minister who he served for all those years was completely okay leaving him in jail. So humiliation and abandonment surround the context of shirt number one, and humiliation and abandonment surround the context of shirt number two. And perhaps Allah is teaching us through the surrounding context of both of those shirts that humiliation and abandonment are some of the hardest things a person can suffer in life. Perhaps that's one of the intended goals of surrounding the shirt with those two recurring dark themes right so a person's dignity is one of the most precious things they have and a person's deep connection with other human beings is yet another you know trust reliance someone you lean on are some of the most important things in a person's life and if tho those things robbed of a person you can have everything else in life when those things are robbed of you you feel like you have no life you feel like you have no joy in life so those shirts being taken from him are also his is his dignity taken from him? Attempted dignity to be removed from him. And abandonment. Like in one case, he's be the treacherous behavior coming from those he loves, his brothers. And another treacherous behavior coming from the one he served so loyally. And he's just leaving him to rot. No problem. So humiliation and abandonment in one and two. And in number three, he sits in a position of honor. So it's reverse of, of humiliation. He's sitting in a position of honor. And no one can take a shirt now or rip a shirt now. He's the one to give the shirt now, isn't it? Allah has put him in that position. And he's grateful now to be not in a position where nobody's going to touch my shirt. I will give my shirt. So it's it's been reversed. And now he's in a position of honor. And he's meant to undo the abandonment by means of the shirt. Because now when he's going to give the shirt to his brothers, they're going to take it to dad and the family will be reunited. So... The two things that happened because of the shirt at the beginning were humiliation and abandonment. And with the third comes honor and reunity, reunification, the opposite of abandonment, right? So that resolution happens with shirt number three. Um, it's also important on a, just building on that theme, the redemption of honor and of abandonment. You know, uh, to help you understand this point, let's think of the two, you know, negative incidents as you know, the, the negative incidents surrounding the shirt, the brothers and the minister's wife, one and two, right? Uh, let's think of it this way. Um, when in old times you had a kingdom, the king wears a crown. When the king, and the king has a throne, right? 
when he dies and there's a new succeeding king, the son or whoever else, right? They don't say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to design a new throne. Guess what they want to sit on? The same throne. They want to make their own crown or they want to wear that crown? They want to wear that crown. And there's a royal robe that the king is supposed to wear. They want to get their own robe or they want to wear the robe that the king wore? They want to wear the same robe. In other words, when you sit in the king's chair, you wear the king's garb. And that garb itself is a precious thing passed down. You understand? The crown itself is 300 years old and is being passed down, right? It's not like nowadays when some, and by the way, even nowadays, the presidential office or whatever, no, I'm not going to go, you know, I want a new desk. It's not, it's the same desk. It's the same Oval Office. No, I want an oct octagon office. No, you get an Oval Office. Because there's, there's a ceremony around the environment, now the furnishings. But in the older times, it wasn't just the throne or the room or the palace. It was also the garb. The clothing was actually passed down. The crown was actually passed down, right? In a sense, you can think of it as Yusuf salam is now wearing the garb, in a sense, the shirt of the minister. Right? He wears the, the clothing associated with the minister, which is interesting. He's, he's the Aziz now, which is interesting because the people who ripped his shirt were the family of the old Aziz, whose job he's now taken. Right? So the people who gave him humiliation by ripping his shirt and allowing that to, and keeping him in, under false imprisonment, are the same people whose shirt he eventually took. Because he's wearing there the royal garb now and in the position where that Aziz used to be, he's in it now. So what you took from someone, you'll end up having to give back. There's a kind of you know return of the wrong that was done to him. And on the abandonment, the brothers took his shirt a long time ago. Physically, they took his shirt. And now uh, they're having to go through the humiliation of taking that shirt back to father. You have to put this in context. For so many years, they've been yelling at dad about, forget Yusuf, he's dead. Come on, a wolf eat him. And now what do they have to go and tell him? With the shirt. Um, he's alive. He said to give you this. Like, what face will you take to your father when after decades of humiliating him about even mentioning Yusuf's name, you're going to take this shirt and hand it to him and say, Yusuf's alive, dad. You don't even have to say, we've been lying to you ruthlessly this entire time. We have been so cruel to you and heartless to you this entire time. We can't even look at ourselves in the mirror, but we have to face you. And I, if it were up to me, I would never have faced you. But he's commanded us to come back and give you this shirt himself. He needs us to face you. He wants us to face you. Like, can you imagine what that's like? Right? So the ones who caused him that are now being made to suffer the consequences of that. One of the members of our group, Hassan Mahmoud, thank you so much, Hassan, uh, for your insights. I'm going to read them to you. So when you take something dear from someone, you will end up having something taken from you. The brothers had their pride and status ripped from them. Likewise, the family of Aziz too. You, took, you caused abandonment and hurt. and humili You caused humiliation, you were caused humiliation. You take something from someone, something you have will take, be taken away. Blinded by the sorrow, and this is still Hassan's uh, insights, blinded by the sorrow caused because of the false shirt and restored because of the true shirt, but yet never missing basira. So he was, one shirt caused him blindness over time, and the other shirt is going to cause his sight to come back. And yet, that entire time, whether his eyes physically could see or not, he never lost insight. And he lo never lost vision of the fact that Yusuf is going to come back. He could see things from for what they actually are, physical eyes present or not. The question com coming to this about his eyesight, you know, Yusuf says, go take the shirt of mine, put it on his face, his eyesight will be restored. The question then arose, how did he know that he lost his eyesight? Because the brothers haven't told him that. They haven't, I mean, not according to the Quran, they haven't said it. Maybe the Quran has omitted that detail. And you can say maybe they told him, and as a result, he responded to this. There have been other explanations. Other explanations include he's a prophet, Allah revealed to him that your father is blind, and Allah revealed to him miraculously that if you put this this shirt of yours on his face, that his eyesight will come back. Right? That would be the miracle aspect of 
being a prophet, you have you get news of the unseen, right? And it could be similar to the argument that Yaqub knew السلام, that Yusuf is alive because Allah revealed to him that Yusuf is alive. Or that he saw the dream in the beginning that 11 stars, the sun and the moon, and he knew what it meant. And it hasn't happened yet, which means it will happen, which means he's alive, right? So he kept his faith in revelation coming from Allah, Azza wa Jal, which is why he never lost hope, right? So that those are good explanations. But there's another interesting explanation. Uh, and this is uh, mentioned... In modern literature, but before we read modern literature, I'm going to read something to you. We, we, we discussed this, uh, Sheikh Suhib and I today, from Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi. And, you know, Razi being a, a genius of his time, and it's a classical, monumental work of tafsir. Um, actually, Suhib considers himself uh, Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi's attorney currently. So if anybody on Twitter misquotes Imam Razi or says something not representing Imam Razi's actual views, he's, he goes after them and says, um, no, he didn't say that. Because, he, I mean, he did translate the first volume of Imam Razi's tafsir, so he gets to be his lawyer. But anyway, so when he shared that with me, I was like, no, I think we need to give due credit. We need to read with our audience what he literally said. And this is centuries ago, right? And Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi is saying this. It could be said. لَعَلَّ يُسُفْ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامْ عَلِمَا أَنَّ أَبَاهُ مَا صَارَ أَعْمَا إِلَّا أَنَّهُ مِنْ كَثْرَةِ الْبُكَاءِ وَضِيقِ الْقَلْبِ ضَعُفَ بَصَرُهُ it could be said that Yusuf السلام, knew that his father hasn't quite become completely blind except that because of the excess crying and the tightness and trauma that he feels in his heart, his eyesight has become nearly blinded. He's, his eyesight has become extremely weak from all the crying and all the stress. So he's getting blurred vision. And that's so he's not completely you know, lost his vision, but he's to the point where he can't clearly see anymore. Okay. فَإِذَا أُلْقِيَ عَلَيْهِ قَمِيسُهُ And when the, thir- the shirt will be th- thrown on him فَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَنْشَرِحَ صَدْرُهُ Then it has to be that his heart will finally feel ease Which we'll get to in a moment But Razi is saying When the father feels the shirt of his son And they say this is your son's shirt and he's alive The joy that he will feel The tension that's been in his heart mounting for years and years that's just going to get released. وَأَنْ يَحْصُلَ فِي قَلْبِهِ الْفَرَحُ الشَّدِيدِ And that his heart that has been grieving with sadness for decades is now going to be flooded with the most intense joy. وَذَلِكَ يُقَوِّ الرُّوحِ And that is going to empower his soul. وَيَزِيلُ الضَّعْفِ And is going to do away with the weakness. عَنِ الْقُوَى And overpower it with the, the, the strength that he feels And at that very moment Even his eyesight is going to feel empowered Like the, the retina is going to feel A rejuvenated sense of life What he's basic And and, and this loss of vision Is going to go away from him This is something that can be rationally understood This is understandable Imam Razi is saying he's going to feel so good that he'll be able to see properly again. That's basically what he's saying, right? Now you would say, what does that mean? You feel good and you're going to get better? That sounds silly. And then he says, Imam Razi says, centuries ago, medical principles seem to indicate that this is a correct idea. That someone, let me summarize what he's saying, that someone experiencing trauma because of some issue, when you replace that trauma with relief from that issue and replace it with the joy, somebody lost someone and they can't find them and they found them, then the trauma caused them not only psychological, emotional distress, that psychological and emotional distress became physical distress too. And when that psychological and emotional distress has been replaced with relief, then with it will come physical relief. That's what he's saying. And this was considered, this is so far ahead of its time that he's actually <laughs> making a connection between the psychological and the physiological, right? It's, it's incredible that this is being said well before modern medicine, well before. And now, you know, if, if you think of it, and, and Mahmoud actually, Hassan Mahmoud wrote this, and I want to read this to you, which is in, in modern literature. That psychosomatic diseases is a reality. Bezel van der Kolk's uh, prominent trauma researcher, he has a book, The Body Keeps the Score. That's the name of the book, The Body Keeps the Score. Discusses how psychological trauma, if left unresolved, manifests physiologically. So we get physical symptoms because of psychological ones. 
If the de deepest source of one's pain is addressed, then true dramatic healing will follow. So we should look beyond the superficial in all matters and identify root causes to our problems, including the spiritual, as individuals, communities, and ummah. And is it that Yusuf alayhi salam, when he says, give him the shirt and he'll be able to see? Hassan asked the question, was three a part of Yusuf, be, Yusuf being taught that wila al hadith? You know, Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah said about him that he, Yaqub told him, you will learn the, the meanings behind all kinds of speech and all kinds of communication, all kinds of events. And is it that Allah has given him the wisdom to know that when you heal somebody emotionally, they start healing physically? And the shirt is going to give him that feeling because you caused him so much pain when he saw my shirt with blood. And now it's going to cause him, it's going to replace the memory of that terrible shirt with this wonderful shirt. It's going to be different now. When he when he sees this, when he feels this shirt, can you imagine? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. When he sees this shirt for the first time, what's he going to do with that shirt? You know? And we're not there in that image yet, but he's not going to let go of it. He's gonna, his face is going to be drowning in it In tears of joy He's, he's going to hug it like it's his own child That's, That shirt is not leaving his side At all He's just like This new This shirt represents relief for him Of so many years And he's looking at it and laughing And looking at it and smiling And looking at it and thanking Allah And all of the pain has disappeared Because the shirt is there right? And so that will cause him healing. And this is something that Yusuf السلام, seems to have been given by revelation too. That this is a you know uh, one of his you know one of the insights that Allah has given him. Another insight that the very source of one's trials can serve as mercy and relief. Each time the shirt was taken represented an apparent new low, but it was the it was all leading towards something far greater and the highest of highs when the shirt was given, meaning. First time the shirt is taken, he ends up in Egypt, a new opportunity. Second time the shirt is taken, he ends up in a, a new law, which is, you know, uh, the, the, the prison and a, even a bigger opportunity, right? So one, an opportunity to understand society, another, an opportunity to actually serve society. So first you understand society, then you serve society, right? So he, he every time Allah put him through something, you notice that really bad things are coming right after shirts, something happens with the shirt. <laughs> Right, so the first time something happened with the shirt, he's in a well, he's a slave, all of this has happened to him. Second time the shirt is ripped, he's in jail. But what's coming after that is something huge and something that's going to be pivotal in his life. Until finally, the final shirt is the ultimate worldly gift that Allah gave him, the and, and spiritual gift too, the ability to serve humanity, the ability to you know relieve his family, the ability to reconcile differences, to remove the effects of shaitan on his family. And so all of it is. Tied in with that third shirt I'll add uh, This is my addition to what Hassan wrote Actually Hassan wrote something more So I'm going to read that first That the very one source, source of one's trials Can be rahmah and faraj Meaning mercy and relief Each time the shirt was taken Represented an apparent new law But it was all leading towards something far greater And the highest of highs When the shirt was given Kingship, family resolution Tawbah, healing It's like inna ma'al usri yusra With every difficulty comes Ease. So each shirt was a difficulty And it came with difficulty And then came after it ease I'll add when the shirt was taken or ripped Which was in bad context Or given In the third case it's not ripped or taken It's given What followed was good in the grand scheme of things So in every case Yusuf salam is earning good And Yusuf salam is either benefiting himself In some remarkable way Learning something in some remarkable way Having an opportunity to help in some remarkable way that he would never have had the opportunity to do otherwise. And all, so what looks bad on the outside isn't actually bad at all. But it does, from a human point of view, looks, looks pretty bad. But in the grand scheme of things, it was all necessary. So what followed was good in the grand scheme of things. Don't judge a situation by what happens right now, but know that Allah can bring about consequences beyond our imagination. Right, So the shirt leads to immediate bad consequences But the good that's coming is beyond what we can fathom Maybe you have to go through some bad things For the good for you to see the ultimate good Now the significance of giving the shirt Let's talk about that for a moment One of the greatest gifts Or one of the greatest acts Is to give when others have taken 
right? I mean, he has had a life of people just what? Taking. And nobody took more from him than his brothers. Really. They took his youth from him. They took his life from him. And it started by taking their sh his shirt from him. And look at the grandness of his heart. He's now giving them a shirt. So he, he's doing something remarkable because he's repairing an idfa' billati hi ahsan, pay back with something that's better. You could pay them back with punishment, humiliation. You could pay them back with a, their own sense of abandonment. Leave this land. I don't want to ever see you. I'll do to you what you did to me. He could do all of that. But he is repaying them with a shirt. And that redemption can also mean Yusuf's aims, aim was to heal the animosity, the enmity that shaitan had sowed rather than take revenge, rather than you know get even. Forgiveness itself is healing not just for but also for yourself. If you want to harbor those terrible feelings about what they did to you, and you don't want to let you want to keep thinking about it, it doesn't just hurt them. Now it's hurting you. It's holding you back from living your life. So forgiveness is also something you do for yourself. You're not necessarily being benevolent, benevolent when you do that. And so he says that the offering of the shirt was taken by his father possibly as a sign that Yusuf has moved on, has forgiven. Now we talked about the nuances of forgiveness and how forgiveness is not the same as what Allah forgives. And there are layers of it. And we talked about that in La Tathriba Alikum Al Yom. So that doesn't need revisiting now. So Haib had something awesome to say. I love you, Sahib, for saying this one. I don't care. Just I don't mind saying it. I got you, my bro. I know this will. I'm going to read this exactly as you wrote it, just so you'd be embarrassed. I know this will sound weird, but the shirt came with the fragrance, his sweat, basically. What fragrance does the shirt have? Well, if you've been wearing it, then it's got your sweat on it, your, your body odor on it, instead of lying blood. So the first shirt had a, blood has a smell, yes. So the first shirt smelled like blood, and the second shirt arguably will smell like what? His sweat. His, his, you know, uh, if you if you wash your children's clothes and if you're, you know, you're around your spouse's clothes, their clothes have a certain scent. Yeah? Okay. The smell of truth was previously blotted out by blood. So the first shirt could not have use of smell because it had blood on it. It was overwritten. It was overrun by the smell of the blood. While blood evokes death, what does sweat evoke? Hard work, striving. Notably, Yaqub salam could smell Yusuf, not some fancy royal perfumes. So later on, Yaqub is going to be lying in bed. He, he doesn't know about the shirt or nothing. They're on their way, and Yaqub salam said something so like profound. He's just in bed around his family, the you know his, his, his son's kids and their wives, and he says, "I'm finding I'm finding Yusuf scent." Yusuf scent, not the scent of the royal of Egypt, not the perfumed cologne scent, but the scent of Yusuf, the scent of hard work, its authenticity. He is still the same Yusuf despite all that has transpired. That's also inside of the shirt. That's awesome. Part of the purpose of the story is how Yusuf, and this is Saqib, by the way, Saqib, who uh, brilliantly helps us with insights from you know, the Old Testament and Genesis, also chimed in, and I thought it was really awesome that he did. Uh, part of the purpose of the story is how Yusuf Alayhisam learns to interpret and through his story perhaps to teach us how to interpret reality. So we're seeing how he interprets things and by way of teaching, teaching us that, Allah is teaching us how to interpret certain things. So in the case of one, one meaning the shirt with the blood. Remember one, two, and three? We're, we're still on that. One, it has false evidence which should not fool a man of faith. Right, so it had false evidence, but it didn't fool Yusuf Islam or Yaqub Islam. Two, it has true evidence; it is ripped, which does not fool an intelligent man. It's meaning it's an it's evidence is proving his innocence, so it has true evidence, but it won't fool an intelligent man, which he acts against anyway. So even if you have intelligence, if you don't have faith, you can't have justice. Right, because the the ministers the, the 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 minister was a smart guy when he realized the shirt ripped from behind smart enough to know Yusuf is innocent right but still didn't do the right thing right so 
you you know you could present false evidence to someone of faith and they won't fall for it they're too intelligent for it and you can present the right evidence to someone intelligent and they won't do the right thing even though they have the right evidence because they don't have faith and then in the third case it has no evidence planted on it it's just a shirt in its natural state and it restores sight so if the shirt is figurative for the world now this is uh, Saqib getting psychedelic on me but i love it he put the ayah there How many miraculous signs there are In the skies and the earth That they pass over And they completely ignore them They're completely oblivious To the miracles they pass by Number one So the, again One, two and three shirt Number one The world has deception Which points away from truth Don't be taken in Number two The world has signs Which point to the truth Don't ignore them Number three, the reality is that rather than looking for signs in the world, the entire world itself is a sign which continually confronts us like being thrown on our face and should, and should give us insight. Now, Take this shirt of mine. Take this shirt of mine. Why mine? Because it was never yours to take He didn't just say take this shirt He said take this shirt of mine Here it, Just remember it's mine It was never yours this, this is not You never take someone's shirt You never take someone's dignity You never take someone from something from someone forcefully So the mine is significant Yeah Something that you find in surahs, even though we're talking, we're going to talk about the organization of the surah eventually when we're kind of at that point. I have a pretty elaborate plan for the rest of the surah. You getting? We're in the nineties. We're almost done. We're not almost done. I'm sorry to disappoint. I got a lot to say and a lot to study, but I will say this: there's something called anchors. So let me tell you what anchors are. I think I invented. It's a bid'ah. I, I made it up. Anchors are sometimes in a surah, Allah will use certain kinds of words. And later on, what seems unrelated, he uses similar words. So these two get anchored with each other. Because if you're a careful reader of Quran or a memorizer of Quran, then you're like, hey, Allah used that kind of word here too and here too. So he's creating a sort of a subtle mental connection between two things that are far apart within the same surah. Yeah? The words are, idhabu bi qamisi hadha. Idhabu bi, which means take away. Take away or go with. Early in the surah, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ Same word. فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ وَأَجْمَعُوا أَنْ يَجْعَلُوهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبِّ When they took him away and they were going to, and they, they reached consensus and they gathered together to put him in the darkness of the pit. They took him away. Now, this is an interesting word play by Allah Azza wa Jal Himself. The first time we saw it take away was when they took him away. And ironically, the one who took, took them, they went with him to take him away, is now telling them, take this shirt and go. So dhahaba dhahaba is interplayed with each other. It's contrasted against each other. It's interesting also that there they said, وَأَجْمَعُوا They gathered. They gathered. And what does Yusuf say to them? Go with this shirt of mine. And bring me, your families, the entire gathering of them. Ajma'een. Ajma'u. Ajma'een. <laughs> this is a play on those words too. Then there's another interesting thing. He said, he didn't say, put it on my dad's face. He said, drop it on my dad's face. Or cast it, or almost like throw it on my dad's face. Put it down on. Alqa means put down. Now if someone's standing, you can't put down a shirt on them. Or on their face. Perhaps subtly, the imagery of the ayah is suggesting that Yus Yaqub salam was sick. He was crying so much. They were saying you're going to get die of sickness by crying. So possibly he's bedridden. And when someone's lying in bed, what's the only way to put a shirt on their face? Drop it on them. So the word drop, alqu, may suggest that he's lying in bed. He can't even get up at this point. And then the shirt is put on his face. Alquhu. It's also interesting that in the Qur'an, this verb is used for transformation, miraculous transformations. Musa's staff, which is lifeless, 
he, Allah tells him to do ilqa of it, alqihi, throw it, throw it down, drop it, it'll turn into a living snake. And now you're finding, throw this shirt to my almost lifeless father, whose eyes are losing life, and he will restore. Right? It's interesting in the in the story of the 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 um, the, uh, the staff and the snake. Uh, I'm reminded of those words for some reason. We'll restore it to its original state. Right? And here, Yaqub Aisam's eyesight will be restored to his original state by the by the casting. It's flipped. There, when you pick it up, it'll restore it to its original state. Anyway, so there's this interesting connection to the word casting or throwing, which has to do with, in the Quran, it's associated with miraculous transformation okay, or divine intervention. Now, he said something else that's really beautiful in this ayah. Every word in this ayah is just so powerful. We, we spent a lot of time on the shirt, so we're not doing that now. Take this shirt of mine, throw it on what? My father's face. Wajhi abi. Well, hold on, he your dad too? And so many places in the Quran, when in the surah, what did they say? Your father. He has a father. A father. Your father. Our father. Those are the phrases that have been used. So the father has been associated with your, our, etc. Yeah? What does Yusuf Alayhi Salam say? Put this on your father's face? Put this on our father's face? No. Drop it on what? My dad's face. Mine. Let me tell you something. Those of you that have kids have experienced this. If you've traveled. You travel away, you have little kids, two-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, whatever. Right? You come back from your trip. They all come and jump you. And the little one comes and jumps you and you pick them up and they're clinging because they know the others want a hug too. No, mine. My dad. My Abba. Mine. No, mine. Mine. And if you hold one of them, the other one says, no, my turn. I want it out. <laughs> Do you understand? Because they've been missing you, the other siblings don't exist. That's my dad, okay? All oh, mine. And they'll like grab your face. It's mine. It's mine. Yusuf alayhi salam has been deprived of his father that he loved so much since he was a kid. There's not a day that's gone by that he doesn't think about his dad. Now he's finally, he doesn't have to hold back anymore. Go take this to my dad. That's my dad now. I get to say he's mine now. And you know what? This is such a profound mirror from what happened in the beginning. You know what they said? Get rid of Yusuf. Your father's face will be only yours. It will become exclusively focused on you. Your father's face will exclusively be focused on you when you get rid of who? Yusuf. And ironically, in the end, Yusuf is saying, alayhi salam, his face and he is mine. Give this to my dad. Put it on his face and put it on my dad's face. I get to take ownership now. You were so jealous and so worried at one stage that he's mine and all mine. You were so worried about that. You know what? Deal with it. Now he is mine. It wasn't like that before, but it is now. I'm going to claim him. His emotions for how much he misses his father have come out of these words and just saying, my dad. Like what his heart must be feeling, I can't wait to see him. How is it going to be when I see him? I have been waiting for you for so long. I've been praying for you for so long. I have missed you so much. The kind of tears they must have shared when they see each other. Just these words coming out of his mouth, how he must have had just tears rolling down his eyes. Take this shirt of mine and put it on my dad's face, on my dad's face. It's also important for you to know that he knows that they've been mean to dad all these years. He knows that. He, and he's saying, you didn't act like he was your dad. So I'm telling you, now he's mine. Just like you didn't act like he's your brother. So I said, this is my brother. Remember that? Because you didn't treat him like yours. So you know what? He's under my shade now. And you didn't treat dad with the right respect. So he's my dad. And you're going to put this shirt on my dad's face. That's what you're going to do now. So, idhabu. 
بِقَمِيسِ هَذَا وَأَلْقُوهُ عَلَى وَجْهِ أَبِي Then he says, يَأْتِ بَصِيرًا He will become someone who can see again. And it also means, he'll come seeing. He'll come seeing. What that means is, his eyesight will be restored, which we talked about, but one dimension we didn't talk about. Yusuf alayhi salam's alive. I get to see my beautiful boy again. Remember that the, one of the qualities of Yusuf alayhi salam is his beauty? He was a beautiful child. And to replace that beauty, Yaqub alayhi salam had no choice but to say, I must find beauty in something else now, and that'll have to be sabr. So he said, sabrun jameel. One thing beautiful has been taken, I have to replace it with something else beautiful. But I, I've replaced it long enough with that beauty. I did my sabr jameel now. I get to see my jameel Yusuf again. And how can I see him if my eyes don't work? So it's like you put your mind to work to restore yourself physically. Like my eyes have a reason to see now. I want to come back to my boy and I want to see him. I will fix my eyes. I will stop crying. I will get better. I know I will. You know what this is? The people are in hospital. They're given a bad diagnosis. And then they're told you should have hope. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I have hope. Mm-hmm. But actually, when you mentally and emotionally lose hope, you have nothing to look forward to, then your physical body stops giving up, all, starts giving up also. And people that never mentally give up and say, I will walk again, I will do it again. They can fall a thousand times in physical therapy and guess what? They're going to be running a marathon in two years. And it's happened a million times. Ya- y- Yaqub salam now has a reason to use his eyes other than tears. He will come to me to see me. He will come with vision because he has reason to see that. He wants to see his family reunited. He wants to see his son that he loved so much. That he hugged and said, don't tell your brothers your dream. That's that's the last conversation. That's since then. And now he's going to come sing, Ya'ti Basira. And then Yusuf Alayhi didn't stop there. He said, and this is what we're going to end with, but this is pretty heavy also. Bring me your families, all of them. Every member of your family. So now he knows his brothers are family men, right? But he knows some other things too. He didn't say bring them. He said bring them to me. He put a little personal touch in there, didn't he? Why did he add that me? Bring me your families. Because you did me a lot of wrong. I won't shame you for what you did, but I will never hold what you did against them. They never did me any wrong. They're my family. I'd love to meet them myself. Bring them to me. I can't believe I have so many nieces and nephews. I have so many sister-in-laws. I want to meet all of them. Bring me every single one of them. I can't wait to be reunited and celebrate with my family and get introduced to them for the first time. I will. I want that celebration for myself. He has lived without family most of his life, hasn't he? He's lived in isolation. His only companion has been his spiritual father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. His father and his, the memory of his father and the legacy of his spiritual father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. But otherwise he has no family. Now Allah has given him a huge family. Right? And it's really important to note here that some people in this life, when they accept our religion, they have no supporting family. They're like Yusuf in Egypt. But they still have their father, Ibrahim. They still have family. But then Allah will replace, Allah will bring into their life good people. And they can have family. Right? <laughs> Those who believe and do good, we will absolutely enter them into righteous company which has been understood to mean in the next life and in this life. Allah will bring you around good people. He will give you a good family. He'll give you a good community. Now, let me tell you something about, I won't name my country where I come from originally, but Muslims in general. When you have a fight with your brother or with your uncle, then your uncle, your cousin, your niece, your nephew, their barber, their neighbor, their pet cat, all of them are your enemy. When you have a problem with one, you got a problem with anybody from that bloodline. And they're all condemned. So if you are seen, 
with any one of them having normal relations, it's like you're a traitor because you had a problem with one. You must boycott all. Do you understand that? All those people's family, we want nothing to do with them. Now that You know whose kid that is? Ah, no, no, no. Oh, wait. But wait. Isn't that what Yusuf's brothers did when they hated bin Yamin because he was associated with Yusuf? You hate Yusuf, but by extension, because he's connected to Yusuf, you hate him. Yusuf is teaching them the opposite. Just because you did the most horrible wrong to me, I will never think of your family as an extension of you. I will think of them as my own family. They're still my family. That every relationship is on its own. Let me give you a scenario. Let's say that a, a son has a terrible relationship with his parent for whatever reason. Maybe it's the father's fault. Maybe it's the son's fault. We're not talking about fault right now. But they're not getting along. Father and son are not getting along. But father and or grandfather and grandson, meaning you don't get along with dad, but you really get along with grandpa, right? You don't get to say, the, the, the father doesn't get to say, he, you can't be nice to him, you can't talk to him, you can't give him advice, he's not even good to me. No, every one relationship cannot influence another. This relationship needs fixing. But you can't say that relationship with your grandfather is on hold or with your grandson is on hold because I still have a problem here. No, you don't get to do that. Every relationship has its own rights. You have a problem with one sibling, that doesn't mean all the other siblings in that family are out. You have a problem with one person, doesn't mean everybody connected to them are out. I will not, I will treat your family, your families with a clean slate as if they are my families. Bring them to me directly, not bring them and settle here. Bring them and I'll find them a place. I don't want to necessarily meet them. No, we, you and I may have some degree of separation, but I'm not going to condemn my nephews and nieces for, because, because of you guys. I'm not going to keep a safe distance from these kids that I would love, that I would want to be a part of their lives. That's No, no, bring me your families. So there's this, such a remarkable balance in that statement of, of Yusuf alayhi salam. And it's such a fulfillment of a hope that Yaqub expressed so, not too long ago when he says, Asa Allahu an yatiyani bihim jami'a. Maybe Allah will bring them to me, all of them. It's interesting. He said, maybe Allah will bring them to me. Allah said, no, I'll bring you to them. <laughs> Sometimes Allah answers on his terms, right? His hope was they'll come. But no, no, you'll go. You'll go. But what you want, I understand. I'll give you better. I'll give you a better land than Canaan. I'll give you, I'll, and it won't just be your brothers, the entire families, everybody will be united again. So this is the statement made by uh, Yusuf alayhi salam as he's leaving them. So now um, I'm going to get ahead of myself. What I plan on doing, I, because I missed a couple of sessions this week, so I do plan on doing a lecture tomorrow night also, even though I have an orientation in the morning. For those of you that are interested in the Arabic program, 9.30 a.m. Central, I'll be doing an orientation here on Facebook. Um, for those of you who don't know, you can go to dreamworldwide.net. That's dreamworldwide.net to read up on the student packet uh, and get details. And then you can ask me questions about what you read uh, tomorrow morning. So I'll, I'll take live question and answer tomorrow at 9.30. But tomorrow night, around the same time as tonight, I will be continuing this uh, this discussion. I'll, I'll try to cover, uh, today was 93, so tomorrow I'll try to cover 94 and 95, which kind of go together, uh, which is the last bit of tension left before the ultimate relief uh, in this uh, story. And we're going to deal with some really interesting questions as, as these couple of sessions come, like, what's it going to look like when they take the shirt back? Right? Okay, so take the shirt, put it on my dad's face, but so how are we going to tell dad uh, that he's alive? And it's not like they can hide it anymore. He is the royal of Egypt. And by the way, let me just set the scene so I don't have to do this in the next lecture. He's not sending them on some donkeys to get dad. He's the second most powerful man in Egypt, practically the most powerful man in Egypt, and that's his father. So he's going to send some kind of royal entourage to give him a royal welcome, because when he comes back, what's he? What we, I mean, we know the surah, so we know at least the basic points. He's going to put them on the throne, right? His parents, they're not going to get off a donkey and get on no throne. They're going to be brought in with a proper reception. That's my dad. He's going to treat him right. 
So the brothers are in no longer any position to be able to hide these facts anymore because now this is a government entourage that's heading to pick up a member of the royal family. That's what's happening with Yaqub Aysam. That's coming and he has no idea. He, he thinks his children will come back to him. Right? That's what he thinks. And then Allah will show us this remarkable turn of events. I hope you enjoyed today's session. I truly am really loving uh, the opportunity to do this. One quick comment before I let you guys go is um, something that I'm, I'm hoping that you pick up on without me having to spell it out, but I think it's okay to spell things out sometimes too. So I'll do so. You know, I, I've been around the, um, you know, the Islamic lecture type scene for a long time, a couple of decades. And there's some remarkable, amazing people that are doing amazing, amazing things. Whether we know their names or not, whether they're famous or not, they're running, they're thinking, they're producing, they're teaching, and they're, they're just doing some incredible work, right? But unfortunately, just like in any other space in, in human activity, in this space also, you wouldn't expect it, but in this space also, there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of people condemning one another, competing with one another. And the public sometimes, hopefully not you as a, because I don't want to speak in general. I want to talk to you as an individual, you as an individual that's listening. I hope you don't ever take part in, hey, have you heard this person's Sira series? Well, that person's Sira series is better. And then you go to the, the whatever sheikh gave a lecture series. By the way, there's another sheikh who gave a lecture on the same surah and it's better than yours. I just wanted you to know. You want to instill some this idea of there's some kind of contest about who knows more or who's better or whatever. And then it's not just this immaturity on behalf of some listener because the fact that somebody's trying to explore, for example, the Prophet's life, and the fact that somebody else is trying to explore and teach something about it are both beautiful efforts. And they may have different insights. You may learn something from one that you didn't learn from someone else. This is, and, and they should they should both be, if they know each other, they should be collaborating with each other and saying, hey, so have you studied this part yet? What did you think about it? And help you. It's not a competition, it's collaboration. There are insights today from Hassan, from Saqib, from Sahib, from Valerie, from... If I get an insight from somebody, it doesn't take away from me to share where I got it from and to give them credit for what they've done. Some people have done amazing work and I've benefited tremendously from it. I want for people that want to learn about Islam to develop a collaborative attitude, especially when it comes to the study of the Quran, that when you find somebody who knows more or is speaking about something with more insight, that you benefit from that. When you find someone else, you benefit from that too. But you don't put a scorecard in your head. I give this one a five. I give this one a seven. I, well, why? This is not sports. They're not doing it to earn ratings or followings. That's not why they do that. That's not why you should be listening anyway. So let's get rid of that negativity. Let's, you know, and, and when people make mistakes in understanding something, what's the thing to do? Well, he said this. I'm not so convinced. I'm not so sure why that's right. Or, you know, I've heard this idea. Here's what I think instead is enough. You don't have to send someone to hell. You don't have to condemn. Like, why do you have to waste your space in your heart and space in your space on your tongue, time and effort on your tongue, speaking ill of someone and condemning someone when you and I don't even know where we're going to end up in front of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said in the Quran, he was commanded to say to the Quraysh, now clearly the Prophet has guidance and the Quraysh don't have guidance. And Allah told the Prophet, commanded the Prophet to say, Qul, ma adri ma bi wala bikum in ma yuha Tell them, I have no idea what's going to become of me or of you. I'm just following what was revealed to me. He won't even condemn the Quraysh to hell. He's commanded to say, Allah can say what he says. But if I'm speaking, I must say, I don't know what is going to become of me or of you. And if that really was the attitude deeply sunk in my heart, I wouldn't have time to be consumed with who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. Who's so wrong and why? Get past it. It's okay. By the way, truth will always win. You don't have to condemn or yell or scream or nothing. You don't have to do that. Truth will rise on its own and falsehood will fall on its own. Ja'al haqqu wa al batilu in al batila kana zahuqa. Falsehood falls apart anyway. Falsehood is weak. 
when people present false ideas, don't be intimidated. Oh my God, everybody's going to follow the false ideas. No, Allah said truth wins. People that will follow false ideas is because they wanted to follow false ideas. When someone seeks the truth genuinely, then Allah does not leave them without guidance. That's our belief. There could be people that, that have no prophets around them, no knowledge around them, no books around them. They could be like the young man in the cave. Allah guided them, right? They weren't prophets. How did Allah guide them without any access to libraries and books and sheikhs and no ijazas and no prophets around? How? Because they genuinely wanted Allah. When you genuinely seek, then Allah will guide. So don't become so consumed with... You know, this this idea of like the Islamic speaker contest This <laughs> is a ridiculous idea It's just a silly idea When people are doing some good, acknowledge it, appreciate it, take benefit of it May Allah Azza wa Jal accept all the efforts of everybody that's making efforts And overlook all of their shortcomings And accept all of us despite of our faults Just, you know, overlooking our faults Because the love we have for this book, the love we have for Allah the love we have for his Prophet وسلم, who would cry in the middle of the night for his ummah, that love is at least when I hear somebody say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah وسلم, when they say Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, my love of Rasul وسلم, keeps me from thinking ill of them because they just told me they love the same one. They have love for Rasul, وسلم, I have love for Rasul. I can disagree with them, I can strongly disagree with them. But I can't hate them And I won't insult them And I won't condemn them But I can intellectually disagree with them In a proper fashion In an appropriate setting Well, What's the point of me broadcasting my disagreements With somebody on, online? What's the purpose of that? What are you going to get out of that? Well, how will that benefit your life? I, 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 it's never benefited my life I've been trying to study Islam for 20 years Never have I sat and listened to someone Condemn someone else Or prove how wrong they are And I got something beneficial out of it not once And when I when you do that My question is Are you done studying Allah's words? So you know everything there is to know about Surah Al-An'am Because Suhaib wrote a PhD thesis on it And it took him several years For one surah But you're done with the Quran So you have time to worry about other people Because Allah's words have less time in your, in, in your day But people's words and condemning them Or correcting them have more time in your day How does that work? I, I don't get it how do you have so much time to, decide, to discuss the differences between this group and that group and that group and that group And you don't even know what were the moments the Prophet ﷺ cried the most You don't even want to know You haven't even explored Why? Don't you have someone, someone who loves you so much that deserves some more time from you? Someone who loves you more than anyone, any creation can ever love you spoke to you He spoke to you and me Doesn't this deserve time? You have time for other stuff, and then you call it you're you know you're serving Allah's deen. How how is that serving Allah's deen? I, I don't get it. I wouldn't serve deen that way. So let's you know, I and I, I genuinely I, I appreciate I'm so happy that I'm part of even if it's a small group where we share and we collaborate and we discuss Allah's words. It's a spiritually rejuvenating experience reading a fellow believer's contemplations on the same ayat that you never thought of. And you're like, wow, Allah opened their heart to this gem And now I get, to, I get to take that little gem And feel the beauty of it in my heart And I can share something with them And it's not like, oh yeah, you got a reflection? Well, I better come up with one <laughs> <It's not laughs> You know, this is, this is, these are gifts that come from Allah May Allah make us a people of contemplation Soften our hearts towards each other And really not allow our hearts to be filled with so much negativity and so much animosity that the beauty of this incredible religion is just lost in all of that. Whatever problem you have with someone can't be bigger than Yusuf Alayhisam's problem with his brothers. If he can say, La tathriba alaykum wal yawm, yaghfirullahu lakum, get over it. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, bye. I can't sink in. I can't like this. I'm going to work on this sink. Hold on.